Hi, I'm Mashida here reporting for World Bites. We're here at the Dorsten Market to get the public's opinion on the increasingly heated debate over assisted dying. Um, I wanted to know, what's your opinion on the um, assisted suicide in becoming legal in this country? I believe it's wrong. Every one of us will die. Yeah. And every one of us will suffer something before we die. Yeah. So I don't think anybody should kill themselves. Because you may think you are worse now, but in future you get better. Yeah. There's a lot of technology coming out, researches and everything. So I believe that all those things may have a cure in future, so people shouldn't kill themselves. I don't think the government should really allow people to do it, but it's someone's own choice, so people are allowed to make up their own mind whether or not to have their life sort of help to die or, or not. Okay. I will speak to that, that person and tell that person, look here, life is much more than death because when you, de when you die, somebody over there going to speak about it and say, well, that person commits suicide because because of his stress or well I know each and everyone have pains yeah. and pain is, is something pain comes and pain goes black purple pink and white who's never that who's never I'm speaking about the beans and I'm not speaking about animals there eh? yeah. animals you can you can kill animals and they, 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 they're saving animals over there no one killing people what happened to us what happened to mankind um, I don't think it's right really because like helping people like someone wants to some like it all needs to be a faster process. You could probably help with like some sort of medication that helps that like, ease the pain and stuff, but nothing to really speed up the process because it's not right. I find it it's like contributing to murder. So I wouldn't I wouldn't really agree with that at all. Really. Well, I, I used to work as a healthcare assistant with like cancer patients for like five years, and we used to get a lot of patients that like, always used to say there, say I wish it could help, like speed up, or they try and ask you to do something, and it's. Me and myself, I would feel like guilty and to do that and it'd be something that will play on your mind and you know what I mean, it's something I just couldn't live with myself in doing. So do you think the government should support people and make it legal that, you know, if people are very ill and they want to die, you know, should the government like make it legal so that can happen? Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, uh, I'm strongly agree uh, with that issue because uh, I was used to be a nurse in my country, and I I, I saw a lot of passion, passion, passion uh, to suffer, um, and, and in a bad conditions, and uh, uh, they would like to die, and there is no regulation in my country about that. I think people want to be in control of what they're doing and I think that that is a very positive thing to do is like give that person that amount of control. Well I know if I had something wrong with me and it was going to make me severely disabled and I was going to suffer a lot I'd just want someone to put me out of my misery. I wouldn't want to suffer it. I don't think the old people that help each other to die, help their husbands to die, whatever should be going to jail. My granddad um, towards the end was asking my uh, family to kill him you know he he was very depressed uh, towards the end because he uh, couldn't lead his normal life but he was okay and he died normally uh, actually through a bit of neglect in the hospital which was something uh, different um, but nothing like what I would think it would be okay for someone to to have that done to them I'd just like to ask you, what is your opinion on assisted suicide? Should it be legalised? Yeah, I think it's a really good idea to legalise it. A lot of people go um, out of their way to travel elsewhere to get help, and I think you normally it's always for a good reason. Uh, someone loved one helps someone else. Do you think that it's wrong that the government get involved in this kind of situation? Should it be a more personal thing? No, I think it's up to the government to legalise it and therefore make it safe and, um, and make sure this whole, this whole system is doing it properly because otherwise people are wasting so much time and money and worrying with travel and health care, etc. that it has to become a government issue and if they legalise it, it would really, really help. Do you think that religion plays a big part in whether assisted suicide should be legal or not? Well, yeah, I mean, I think Roman Catholics don't believe in it. Um, I'm not too sure what other religions think about it. But it, at the end of the day, if you... If you have absolutely no reason to live anymore and you're going to the stage where you can't make the decision for yourself, then it's only fair for you and your family to talk about it and make, you know, the decision, make it a personal thing. But assisted suicide is for people who, you know, physically can't go on, 
um, and and they feel you know their lives have become a burden to themselves and others. It's not just for people who are depressives who just want to kill themselves. It's people who make a choice to take a step out of life, you know, to, to finish their life when they choose. Why should they be forced to, you know, die, you know, a terrible, slow, painful, you know, drawn out death when they could just decide to like just leave the room? This is people who have made a conscious decision with their families that this is the right thing for everybody involved. It's not somebody who just decides to hang themselves or slit their own wrists, you know, for their partner or loved one to come back and find them dead on the floor. This is a, a way for people to, you know, say goodbye and, you know, have that moment together and that's it. I think it, there should definitely be a discussion about it, but, um, but it's, it's, it's a taboo that needs addressing, you know. why. Why can't people decide to end their own life? If they can decide to change their sex or decide to have plastic surgery, why can't they decide to die? Physician-assisted suicide is wrong morally, medically and politically. We're not cold-hearted or inhumane. We recognise the immense suffering that at times drives people to such an option. However, on balance, we think it is the wrong move. The context of this debate is one where we think we are in danger of witnessing a change in human values. From a society which regards life as something sacred to one where death is a means of escape. It doesn't matter whether one is motivated by religious reasons or atheist humanist motives. We think that life is not only worth fighting for, but that we must give affirmation to those who struggle against all adversity, be it physical or mental. For us, the value of life and the pleasures of life can be experienced even if one is paralysed from the neck down or suffers from any other severe impairment. Just think of Stephen Hawking, who despite his disability, has made vast contributions to the world of science. The problem we now face, however, is that our culture seems to validate giving up and letting go. In fact, this is increasingly presented as the dignified thing to do. But for those of us who value all humanity, it is imperative that we make clear that the dignity of life involves fighting against all odds and sending a message out very clearly that we should be valued and can experience the pleasures and joys of human experience no matter what our condition. We understand the individual cases of heartbreak involved. However, we must look at the bigger picture because in the words of Clifford Longley, your right to die undermines my right to life. Thus, a society that gives legitimacy to physician-assisted suicide in effect redefines certain groups as a burden, as a lesser form of life. Without doubt, this will send out a dangerous message to those who suffer extreme illness and are dependent upon others. They'll see themselves as a burden. To relieve society of that burden, they will choose to go down the route of physician-assisted suicide. This is the reality of our opponent's argument. For this reason, we conclude that physician-assisted suicide should remain illegal. My partner Jenna and I intend to demonstrate that physician-assisted suicide is the only ethical and practical choice available to, available to us outside of euthanasia. We stress that we propose a system based upon the current system operated in Oregon. Under this system, physician-assisted suicide is defined as a system in which a doctor prescribes life-ending drugs to patients without physically administering them. We would make this process available only to the terminally ill or patients with incurable medical conditions who personally feel that their lives have been made unlivable. We also propose that anyone with a psychiatric problem should not be allowed to commit physician-assisted suicide. Now, we strongly believe that if people are determined to end their lives, that they will attempt to do so. However, this can be a very painful process. According to Dignitas, 98% of suicide attempts are unsuccessful and generally worsen a person's condition. By consulting a doctor and being prescribed effective medication to end their lives, patients can avoid such pain. In this way, physician-assisted suicide is a merciful act. Furthermore, under the current system, relatives who assist their loved ones are, in ending their lives at their request are considered as criminal. 
and can be prosecuted for manslaughter, with a maximum potential sentence of 14 years, according to The Guardian. This is also the case for relatives that help their loved ones to travel ab abroad to die. Ladies and gentlemen, this is inhumane. Almost everybody in the UK has people near to them who have suffered unbearable pain, and few, can, and few could ignore the wishes of such loved, one, loved ones. Introducing a system of physician-assisted suicide would free carers and relatives from the burden of such emotional responsibility. They could help the people close to them without outrageous personal risk. In conclusion, between 5 and 10% of those dying cannot have their pain adequately relieved, even with the best palliative care. This is according to the organisation Friends at the End. I have three reasons why we should keep physician-assisted suicide illegal. Where this legislation is in place, the so-called safeguards against this abuse just don't work. Let's take just one example. Oregon. It has been independently verified that as many as 18% of those killed with lethal drugs supplied by their doctors were suffering from treatable depression, which their doctors failed to detect when assessing them. Furthermore, the American Journal of Psychology states that around 7% of euthanasia victims in Oregon were motivated by internalised feelings of guilt and being a burden on their families. So shocking has these revelations been that it has provoked a reassessment of the Death with Dignity Act in Oregon. Officially, the British campaign wants to limit assisted dying to the terminally ill. But scratch the surface, and its supporters openly admit that they would like to go further. Margot MacDonald wants to extend it to people with degenerative illnesses. Mary Warnock thinks people with dementia are a waste of life and should be included in the bill. If that's not bad enough, Ludwig Minelli, director of Dignitas in Switzerland, thinks anyone should be allowed to die. Quote, there should be no qualification of euthanasia. The euthanasia brigade see no end to the categories of people they consider to be fair game for assisted suicide. Physician-assisted suicide will redefine the role of medical professionals in a way we are not prepared to accept. Doctors are there to save lives and not assist suicide. That's why over 90% of doctors who specialise in palliative care have consistently expressed their opposition to such a move. Slippery slopes, flaws in the legislation, abusing the role of doctors, but above all, giving up on life. These are why we say keep assisted suicide illegal. Does it not seem hypocritical to you that we allow owners to put down sick animals to avoid cruel suffering, but do not grant humans the same mercy. People with terminal or incurable illnesses deserve that right, and who are we to refuse it? Of course, many people, like Stephen Hawking, with debilitating and terminal conditions, lead fulfilling and meaningful lives, but equally there are those who do not, and wish for a merciful end to their suffering. Doctors can control the physical pain caused by these diseases to some extent, but no drugs can stop the psychological pain of being unable to move or communicate with anyone, of being washed and turned by carers and desperately longing for the mobile, independent life they once had, but that is now out of reach. There is no analgesic for the sense of loss, powerlessness and indignity that accompanies degenerative illnesses in the final stages. Whatever your political or religious views, surely we can all agree that all humans have a right to dignity, and when someone's life becomes unbearable and they no longer have dignity, they have a right to mercy. As John Stuart Mill said, we should have a personal autonomy, as long as it does not harm anyone else. Surely our death is a pretty important part of our lives, and so we should have a choice where possible as to, how, as to the nature of our death. I've explained that we all have a right to both mercy and choice, which means that we must legalise physician-assisted suicide. So it's for these reasons, and the reasons that my partner Davy has already outlined, that I urge you to vote for the opposition, and do not condemn the terminally ill to end their days imprisoned in a body where they no longer feel alive. Thank you. Thank you. Physician assisted suicide involves actively doing something, administering medication of some kind that shortens life. Uh, what, what view do you take about withholding treatment from people who are suffering? Is that the same thing if, if, or is it genuinely different? And if it isn't genuinely different, what's the argument against physician assisted suicide? The people that are travelling to Switzerland to, to, um, to Dignitas to die. And it's interesting that do you do you think that the fear of prosecution for the family members, for people to help them, um, actually is, is getting people to travel there much earlier than they would choose? 
and therefore ending their life earlier. So if we were to actually legalize physician-assisted suicide in the UK, that they might actually live longer knowing that they would be able to die within the time that they want to. We believe that withholding treatment is just the omission. It is, a, it is not the act of directly killing a patient. What it is doing, it is getting the disease and having it take the natural course. It is not the same as physician-assisted suicide. Physician-assisted suicide involves the actual intention of killing a patient to end someone's life earlier. With withholding treatment, you, you are taking the conscious decision to say, I'm not going to have any treatment. I'm going to take the natural course. By turning off someone's life support, you're just letting their, their, their death take its natural course. By um, actually administering a lethal drugs or giving someone a prescription of lethal drugs, you're in fact validating this entire concept of giving up on life. If someone wants to not have any more medication because they feel that their life is coming to its natural end, then that's very different to, to saying, my terminal illness um, is taking me over and I want to take back the power and I want to kill myself. I think there's two very big distinctions to make. It, it is a shame that people do go over to Dignitas and places like that to commit suicide and have voluntary euthanasia. But I think that is irrelevant in this case because we're talking about bringing a law of physician-assisted suicide in our country. And I think that has far greater social ramifications for society. So you're saying that the family of the one must suffer for the, for the greater good? Yes, in a, in a sense, because... I'd, I mean, the thing is, is that with dignity, with the idea of dignity, with the idea of humi humiliation and being subjected to a disease, it is completely subjective. And what we're saying now in society is that we're going to define dignity as this thing. We're going to say that, well, I'm humiliated because I don't have my bodily functions. But if we start to say that that is where um, human life ends, that is where dignity ends. We're in far dangerous waters than we know. It's a far greater indictment on society if we don't try and help those people to understand that humiliation is not... Um, dignity does not come down to physicality. It is not purely material. And if we don't sort out that problem first, then we're not going to limit, uh, reduce the numbers going over to Dignitas. Traditionally, people used to regard people who committed suicide as, as acting when the balance of their mind was disturbed. I think it's become quite clear that many people commit suicide in quite a, as a quite a rational calculation, even though they may not be terminally ill or indeed psychiatrically ill. Now, the question is, what should a doctor do when somebody approaches them requesting the uh, support with committing suicide in, in such a way? I'm just interested in the idea of uh, bringing in a law, and I'm curious as to where you draw the line. What, where do you say that this person can and this person can't? Do you have a list of all the sorts of conditions where somebody can and where somebody can't? And do you say he can, but she can't? How do you judge what's bearable and unbearable to a person um, and not another? We really do respect and, and highly value human life. How does that fact consist with the idea that we should um, allow people help to die when they choose to? Of course, in society, we do put a high value on life. However, um, there's already countless examples in society where we know that this, the preservation of life does not hold a monopoly over everything else. Uh, for example, as, in, as has been mentioned before, the turning off of life machines and the right to refuse treatment shows that we d don't just think that the sanctity of life means that we have to preserve it at all costs. And also the point that for some people, when a terminal illness gets to a very late stage, for them it doesn't feel like a life, and so that... It can't really be, um, is it actually right for us to preserve life beyond recognition? I agree. I think it, show, it shows that we respect life in, a, in allowing people to end it before it becomes something that they um, can't, can't bear. Obviously a doctor can't decide what for one person is unbearable, but a list of circumstances where it might be the case and then you have to review each case independently. Um, but we, are going to, we, we would not condone it if someone was not terminally ill. The problem one often comes across in medical practice is that patients change their minds. And uh, they, pe people, and one of the reasons it seems to me why it's very popular through opinion polls, there's a very strong popularity of this, people anticipate how they would feel if they had such an illness. In fact, when they experience such an illness, they often respond quite differently. And it, this raises the question about people may make end of life determinations of one sort or another, anticipating circumstances which, which arise. When the circumstances actually do arise, they actually respond to them quite differently. 
it seems to me that the, there's a danger that, that, that you haven't really acknowledged here about the excessive formalizing of these procedures can create a dynamic which gives uh, the decisions made up to when people are in a different state of mind, a different state of health, some great, some potentially catastrophic significance in terms of their end of life care. It's not, as, as in other, some other forms of suggested euthanasia where you make a decision before and say, when I get to the stage I want this to happen and then be kind of lying there speechless saying, oh, I've changed my mind. This is happening, uh, you make the decision and then the patient has to take the drug themselves so that they can change their mind right up until the end. Um, and so I don't think that that would be too much. And obviously patients will be carefully reviewed by physicians. It wouldn't be just pop down to the doctors, get it prescribed and take it the same night. There would be a form of um, counselling and everything. And I think that would also help patients to be able to explore their disease more, more thoroughly and be made aware of the wide range of palliative care because obviously you'd be um, made to go through a lot of palliative care before you'd be able to get this. So it would actually increase people and a lot of people would probably decide against it in the end. What, what would you say to the um, idea that bringing in a law into this country would have great ramifications for the rest of society and what morals we have in terms of our values and in terms of the idea of sanctity of life? The ramifications on society, whilst not particularly massive, would be that we are accepting that there is a point where, for some people, their life is completely unbearable and not worth living, and that we're showing mercy to our fellow human, and I don't see how that would be a negative ramification on society at all. That people feel like a burden, and therefore we should give them the outlet to kill themselves, because actually we don't value life anymore. We just want them to die, because they're just too much bother for all of us to take care of. We don't want them to die. They want to die. Yeah, they want to die because they okay, feel like a burden. Okay, I think, I think we, maybe. we would have to make sure that this was a personal decision, um, also, in relation to that, I mean, it's, it's not the case that this will always, that, um, for example, an elderly person may, who may feel like a burden might not necessarily qualify for the terms of our um, uh, physician-assisted suicide. It, they would have to have terminal illness uh, and be uh, suffering from, or, or be suffering from an incurable medical condition that really, really um, makes their life unlivable. Is it, and also, um, there are many people that uh, require this system and who are not considered burdens. Is it fair to uh, withhold that system from them uh, in favour of those that uh, might be abused? The, uh, be the abuse from the okay, abuse okay, of the okay, system. Okay, no, stop, stop. Um, very good. Davy and Jenna, you now have a chance to pin them down with a very precise question. They can come back on it briefly, then we go to the audience. Um, my question, you mentioned the natural course and allowing the natural course to continue. I'd like to know why you feel that that is necessarily the right one. Is it not sometimes more uh, humane to um, prevent the natural course from occurring? And my question is, um, uh, in, the, in the questions you got talking about what like, defined giving up and what defined suicide, um, and you said that withdrawing medical treatment was not giving up and was not um, committing suicide. But, so if I was diabetic and needed insulin and stopped taking it, would that not be considered giving up and committing suicide? I don't believe for one minute that to withdraw medication, to stop giving yourself the, uh, the means to survive, is not necessarily giving up. It is an omission of drugs. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying to yourself, I'm completely giving up and I don't want to live anymore. It's pretty much saying that I'm going to take the natural course. There's a huge difference between committing suicide yourself and choosing to do that and asking for the state to intervene in that. When you ask the state to intervene and make a law to, to allow you... Um, Assist, physician-assisted suicide, you are asking for wider cultural validation for giving up. Going right to your point about people not being able to afford to go to Switzerland, do you really think they're going to leave it at that? What's going to stop them from going out and, say, throwing themselves under a train? Do you not think that this is completely lacking dignity? And it's also going to put extra stress on their families and also the emergency service workers and the passing public. You seem to be putting too much faith in doctors. For example, an AIDS concerned officer in 2000 said that doctors frequently used uh, do not resuscitate orders on, pa on patients without consulting either them or their family. How much worse is this problem going to become if we allow doctors to actively assist in the killing of patients? With the physician assisted suicide in Switzerland, it's um, you're dying by yourself in a room with a video camera watching you, you know, it's not very dignified. And um, most of the cases, I think it was like 
6 out of 10 or 8 out of 10, something like that, most of the cases that actually committed suicide, it was because they were depressed. And so surely something like someone else said about attitudes, surely the attitude should change and have psychological treatment rather than just killing them off, which is the cheaper and easier alternative, but not necessarily right. Michael Freeland, who was 64 years old, had a 43-year history of depression and numerous suicide attempts. Yet, a physician said psychiatric consultation was not necessary. Over the last four years, only 2% of people have been referred for psychological evaluation before the legal, legal drugs. This is from the Oregon Department of Human Services. Moreover, according to the American Journal of Psychiatry, only 6% of psychiatrists are really confident enough in, in uh, diagnosing depression from the first consultation. You get only one consultation from, from the um, safeguards in place. This is where it fails. If you ca capital punishment was, uh, was illegalised mainly for the point that you could kill an innocent person. This is far more dangerous. You could kill someone that could have depression, and this is not something that we should be condoning. We think that the context of this debate is that we're almost at a sort of um, uh, moral crossroads. And we do need to have, you know, some, some underlying principles in society. And, and where is the dignity in being treated like a child when you're older? Well, the fact is, is, is that if you need help going to the toilet, if you need help showering, if you need help, you know, uh, being taken to the shops, to me, that doesn't matter because life is to be valued above everything. And just because you are disabled or just because you are terminally ill, that doesn't mean that you don't have dignity in life. And that certainly doesn't mean that you don't have a quality of life. I'd like to stress that we would definitely continue uh, a strong palliative care system, but also I think it's unfair to dismiss the opinions of the terminally ill uh, or with incurable medical conditions just because they are vulnerable. I think because of that we have to listen to them all the more, and if they choose to die uh, because of their condition, we have to take notice. You're saying about just because you're terminally ill doesn't mean you've lost all quality of life. But I can't remember the exact statistic, but for Oregon about 80% of people who requested physicians to suicide said it was for the exact reason they'd lost their quality of life. That was what they said. How do you know what they're feeling? You said that you value life above every, everything else, but that's not really the question. The question is whether you have the right to decide for other people, whether they value life above everything else. We have the human right to exercise our autonomy, provided it doesn't wrongfully affect other people's freedoms, and we are mentally sound. So I'm just wondering whether you consider these people to be mentally ill to want to escape unbearable pain, or whether you think that they're selfishly harming other people, or whether you're just denying their human rights because of your own morals. I'd like to ask you, what, what gives you the moral authority to, to tell me when I can and, and cannot die? Uh, I'd, I'd actually take the point of view that uh, banning assisted suicide is actually in convention of, uh, in breach of my human rights. And there's part of Article 8 on the EU Convention on Human Rights, which is to do with personal freedom of choice and autonomy. And uh, I'd say it was my personal choice, and, and if I wanted to, to die a, a couple of days early, I think that's my, my right to do so, and I'd ask where you stand on this authority. You've already said that you would offer assisted suicide to those with incur incurable diseases, whereas the bill that was proposed in 2006 was only for those who would die within six months with a terminal disease. So already you have progressed to encompassing more people in this legislation. Do you not think it would be easy once it was in place for the net to widen and widen. And I'm also interested to know what both sides think about the case in Australia, where similar legislation was introduced but then later taken back due to many problems. I think maybe the statistics you've kind of brought up have overstated the case. You've sort of mentioned a lot of kind of suicide attempts, but have you considered that uh, studies sociologically and psychologically have found that the vast majority of suicide attempts are not intended to be successful, they're intended as a cry for help? Um, and statistics regarding Dignitas membership, uh, the Independent reported 800 Britons had applied to Dignitas to end their life, with only less than 10 being successful in terms of following up their inquiry and actually being approved by Dignitas as suitable. And I also think you're kind of, you're not understanding the wider issue regarding human rights in terms of rationality. If you're going to support the rationality of a terminally ill person to end their life, how far does that extend in terms of people who aren't ill but can justify their wish to end their life rationally. If I think I'm a burden and you're saying that being a burden is no motivation for um, physician-assisted suicide, 
But I would put it to you that it's my liberty to die, no matter what my motivation. You seem to be treading dangerously closely to telling me how to think. You were saying how at one point that everyone will be given the right to die, but it's technically it's going to be the right to be killed because this kind of turns our doctors into our executioners. And I think this is going to have like ramifications on the doctor-patient relationships. It is illegal for a family to help somebody travel abroad, but nobody is ever sentenced for it, so does that not show that it's, um, it's essentially accepted as legal in our current legal system for, some, for somebody to try and put down the I find it frankly disgusting that you're comparing disabled people to animals that we should put down. We can do to our own bodies um, what we wish. However, the difference with assisted suicide uh, is that we're asking the state to provide us with drugs to end our lives. And as soon as we call upon the state to do that, we're asking for society to essentially um, legitimise or uh, affirm the idea that we can give up and let go. And this is the position that we do not want to be as in, in a society. If you want to see it as imposing morality, you can. But the thing is, is that today, in what seems to be a complete moral vacuum, where there's just so much relativism around, we are here <laughs> to uphold the standard of a set of moral values. We, we see life as sacred, yes, of course. And do you know what? I'm a Christian. She's an atheist. I don't think there's any religion... Religion has nothing to do with this, because there is a common ground. Yes, we accept that there are different morals in society, but we, we have to draw a bottom line. There needs to be a common standard that life is completely sacred and we should not just merely give up because of a change of circumstance. And obviously there are differences between animals and humans and there's a lot more we tried to do for humans before we made the decision um, to let them have physician-assisted suicide. However, if we extend that mercy to animals, how can we not extend it to humans who we universally regard as being even more important than them? We are arguing on first principle terms. We regard life as precious. And in this age of moral relativism, we need to fly the moral flag. We seem to ignore the effects, the greater effects on society. It is not merely the right to suicide, but the right to physician-assisted suicide is, is for society to accept the suicide as an OK thing, the right thing to do. It is giving up on life. 30 seconds. And what is obviously a cry for help Personal choice is paramount in our proposed system. We would have a serious duty to regulate assisted suicide. No system is perfect, but we would act to minimise risk. We must not underestimate the ability of the terminally ill to make rational decisions. And no matter how many rational people feel that they would like to continue in life, we must help those who don't. Uh, you simply just agreed that we, we are all of equal moral worth. And that, so why do you uh, feel that people that are terminally ill have more of a right to die than the rest of us? If we have the autonomy to choose our own destiny, why not open the safeguards so anyone can resist, uh, request physician-assisted suicide? Surely, advocating safeguards is completely contradictory. Second, you simply have not explained how this practically will work. 30 seconds. The example of Oregon has shown that safeguards do not work and it is a complete slippery slope. Look at Michael Freeland, look at the cases of Kate Cheney people who may, and under normal circumstances, want to end their lives, uh, we believe that life can get better and there can be improvements made, whereas with the terminal illness, it's not going to get better. Uh, someone um, at the back was talking about how it wasn't dignified to go to a clinic um, in a room and swallow something with a camera, but you don't have to be alone, and surely that is a lot more dignified than dying in a hospital bed attached to tubes when you can no longer communicate at all. And finally, we, um, yes, we admit that we're basing our system on Oregon, but it doesn't mean that we're... Uh, completely going to imitate it. We think that everyone should be, uh, have a psychological review and people who have a 23-year history of depression should not get physician-assisted suicide. Seconds. Uh, the opposition began by saying that they are not cold-hearted and inhumane. I beg to differ. It is cold-hearted and inhumane to force someone with no prospect of improvement to either watch their dignity slip away before their eyes or else try to end their own lives by their own methods, such as by starvation, which, lasts, which takes many, many days. Humane, loving... Moral? I think not. Uh, I applaud your passionate espousal of your, of your cause, um, but I, I did think that you relied rather heavily on the emotional aspect of the argument. 
and in this kind of debate where there is a good deal to be said on, on both sides, it's tremendously important to focus, I think, on the, uh, on the logic as well as on the morality of the issue. I think, um, in a sense, uh, you have the most difficult side of this difficult argument in, in the sense that, uh, that there is a sort of popular, as evidence in opinion polls, support for the uh, alternative position. And therefore, I think you had a difficulty, uh, a difficulty inherent in that. Also, you had a difficulty in defending your position without resort to uh, religious arguments, which is, the, as we know, the, the mainstay of that <coughs> point of view and has been in the various House of Lords and other debates that have been held about it. So I think that that put you in a difficult position, but I think that you handled that well. Uh, and I felt particularly, I thought Leanne argued very forcefully, but also articulately and uh, sometimes perhaps excessively assertively, but I felt also very clearly, uh, uh, particularly in relation to the question of uh, the role in the, the, the consequence of inviting the state to play a major role in this whole area, which I think as a practicing doctor one would regard with some anxiety. If there's one um, observation about the way you made the case, uh, that the, there are two separate issues. One is the question of principle, and the other is the question of how it would in practice be uh, applied. And uh, what, what you both did in organizing your case, you talked about practicalities, you talked about the, about the question of principle more, but in, in fact, in both cases, what you did was you ran the two together. So you have a conception of a, of a kind of law and a, and a kind of process that would be involved. And you argued from that, from, from a specific suggestion about how physician-assisted suicide might work. And you involved in that uh, suggestion the, the, the points of principle. Um, so uh, I think both those things needed to be said, but they needed to be said in a way that clarified the separation between them all. And I think you, you had a, a more popular argument to begin with, but I think there was a strength in it in that you, you did uh, uh, admirably cleave to the philosophical high ground in it and didn't concentrate too much on the pragmatics and the practicalities of it, which I think is a certain weakness in, in terms of the issues about dignitas and people travelling to Switzerland and the and all that, which I think and I think you quite wisely left that to your responses to the later questions. And I thought also you were very good in coming back on some of these more specific points, particularly the invidious consequences for families and doctors of the current legislative situation, which I, thought you, which I thought you dealt with very well. I thought Jenna also argued the case very well and uh, was particularly sensitive in responding to some of the issues about this slippery slope argument and, the, and was sensitive in delimiting the scope that you would propose around uh, the sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, acceptance of physician-assisted suicide. I thought that was well handled. Who were you most persuaded by? Were you most persuaded by Leanne and Robert arguing for the motion that physician-assisted suicide should remain illegal? Please put your hand up. 25 for Queen's. Um, who was most uh, persuaded by Davy and Jenna from Darren Johnson? OK, I'm not going to count that. I would say it's in the region of about 50. Um, so the audience have given it two-thirds to Durham Johnson, one-third uh, to Queen's. So well done, Durham Johnson, on that. Um, now, um, yes, round of applause. Um, right, well, we've, it, it did take us a long time to come to a decision because the debate was, um, it was quite equal on both sides and we thought there was a lot of points made that were fair. Um, however, I'm not going to put you in too much suspense. Um, we did... The, the team that won, uh, we felt, took a lot of points on board and were able to take it and put it into their arguments from both the audience and from the judges and from the other team. The fact they had good teamwork and they worked really well together and seemed to feed off each other. And they also seemed to have control of the debate um, right from the start and sort of owned it. And that team is Durham. Congratulations to Darren Johnson. Well done to Queen's. You've been superb. Uh, throughout.